Well, it is great to see all of you here on this holiday weekend, to see this room very close to capacity as we uh, prepare uh, for summer and we prepare hopefully before long to be back over in our building. And it's great to have our little ones with us this morning, our children and our students. You know, uh, sometimes we put them off in other buildings and we just forget that they're even here and they're a part of things. And for some of you, I know that's your relief moment of the week. Um, but they're a part of the church too. And we are glad when we get to bring them together and to worship with them, to model for them what it means to live a life of worship and to, to sit and to hear God's word. And that's the opportunity uh, we have this morning. We started a series last week uh, that we're doing for the next three weeks, including last week. And that is uh, a series on spiritual warfare. And, and we talked about the fact last week that there is an enemy and that this enemy has a plan. He has schemes for your demise. He wants to bring ruin to your life. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to kill your spiritual development. He wants your devastation. And that this battle that takes place is taking place in a spiritual realm in heavenly places. And then in those heavenly places, Christ has been uh, resurrected and is seated in heavenly places with every spiritual blessing that you and I need. And we are seated there with Christ, but there's this battle going on and that we have everything we need to win the battle. And that really winning the battle is about learning to just stand in the authority of Christ. And that the authority of Christ is greater than the power of the enemy. It's greater than anything he can do against us. So we just have to stay centered in his authority and not move outside of Christ in order to have victory. Now, how do we do that? That's what we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks as we look at the armor of God. And as we look at how do we get dressed to stand in battle? How do we get dressed to stay centered in the authority of Christ? And know that the things that we're going to talk about are not just things of this world. They are things that are supernatural. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So the way that we destroy these fortresses, the way that we destroy speculations and these lofty things in our life is that we take every thought captive so that we can stand in the authority of Christ. And he's given us everything that we need, which are supernatural weapons. And so we started last week looking at Ephesians chapter six. If you have your Bibles with you, you can flip over to Ephesians chapter six, and we're gonna start reading there in a few minutes. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, the verses will be on the screens up here. And this morning, we're gonna look again, like we did last week, at a lot of scripture. And so I uh, just encourage you to follow along uh, as you can or follow along on the screens. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 15. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This morning, we're going to look at those three parts of the armor of God. And the first thing that we're told to put on is we're told to put on the belt of truth. Now, truth is this thing that has a way of just making life a lot more simple. Uh, I won't ask you to raise your hands. I'll just watch for your facial expressions. Anybody ever told a lie that just hung around for a long time and just made your life miserable? I'm sure I'm the only one, right, that ever did something deceptive. I was eight years old. There's been others, but we'll go with this one. <laughs> Point of confession. I was eight years old, and my mom had this crystal sugar bowl with a crystal lid, and uh, we didn't have a lot of nice things. It had been a gift to her, and one day, I wasn't even supposed to be doing anything with sugar, but I was eight, and there was sugar, and so, hey. Um, and so uh, I took the lid off, and I dropped it and it broke into two pieces. And so I did what any eight-year-old boy with a little mischievous side and not wanting to get in trouble would do. I took the two pieces and I very carefully put them back together on top of the sugar bowl, hoping that the next person would come and go to lift the lid off and it would just fall apart and they would think that they had done it. Didn't say it was a good plan, but it was a plan. 
Well, by the time uh, my mom came in the kitchen and found it, the weight had already drawn the two pieces and they had fallen apart. And so uh, my mom and dad brought the kids together and uh, they asked the question, who broke the sugar bowl? Now, uh, I did, again, what any eight-year-old boy would do because we had this wonderful parenting policy in my family that is if no one admits to it, everybody gets in trouble. And so if you can take your brother and sister down with you, awesome. Um, and uh, so uh, they said no, and I said no, and just swore I did nothing to do with it, and it wasn't me. And so we all got punished, and I don't remember what the punishment was. Uh, but I do remember that evening, my brother and sister, who are both older than me, uh, held me in the kitchen floor and basically beat the snot out of me, <laughs> trying to get me to admit that I was the one who had broken the sugar bowl lid. And uh, I just, did, I did great. It was like I was preparing to be a POW someday. I refused to give in. I refused to admit that it was, I was the one. I was the guilty one. Years go by and this nags at me. It's something so small, but it nags at me. So I'm like 19 years old and we're at a family gathering and I finally decide it's time to come clean. Over a decade later, I stepped forward and said, hey, I just want you to know I broke the sugar bowl lid. By that time, I was big enough. I was bigger than them. There was nothing they could do. So I felt like it was a safe time to confess. Uh, but, you know, this thing just weighs on us when we live outside of truth. Truth has this way of making things simple and making things livable. Now, the belt of truth, uh, we need to understand what was going on with a Roman soldier and his belt. So a Roman soldier would put on this belt over a tunic that they would wear that normally came down to around their knees. And so they would put a belt around their waist, and it seems like such a simple piece of equipment, but it was really the centerpiece of everything else that they would put on. On their belt, they would, they would have different pieces of equipment, their canteen, their, their, their sword might be on their belt, a dagger would be on their belt, much as George uh, here uh, in his belt, in the modern version, has things on his belt, his utility belt. And it also holds his pants up, which is uh, a good thing. Uh, but for a soldier uh, in the Roman time, it held everything together, but it sort of gave them the opportunity to have pants because what they would do is when they prepared to go into battle, they would take their tunic and they would pull it up between their legs and tuck it back into their belt. So it was almost like they had shorts on so that they had free mobility to go into battle. So this belt was very important. The breastplate of righteousness, we're going to talk about in a minute, and the breastplate would quite often have loops at the bottom that would fasten to the belt to hold the breastplate in place. It was the central piece and the foundational piece of what a Roman soldier was going to wear. And it's so true for us that the foundational piece for us in putting on the armor of God is this thing called truth. You see, we have an enemy, but our enemy, he is full of lies and he constantly lies to fulfill his plans. John 8, says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The enemy cannot speak truth. He, he's almost so caught up in his nature of being a liar and of untruth that it defines who he is. And yet scripture tells us in John 14, 6, that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So there is this polar difference between who Christ is and who the enemy is. And so we are called to put on Christ, to put on truth, to fasten it around us. Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, Paul, a bondservant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness and the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. God is incapable of doing something that is not truth. If you want to read some other verses on your own time about this, you can look in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. 
And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29, this concept that God cannot lie. He is truth. And so we are to put on this form of truth, but we're also to put on a practical truth. Not just this mystical put on Jesus, he's the truth. Because Jesus is the determiner of all the practical truths that exist on earth. The things that you deal with, he determines what is true and what is right. Why? Because he's the creator of everything that exists. He's the one who put everything in motion. He knows it best. He understands it best. He understands what is true about it. And he is omniscient. He is all knowing. Now we live in a world where truth has been marginalized. We live in a world where truth has become this relative thing. In other words, you can believe what you want to believe to be true, and you can believe what you want to be to be true, and I'll believe what I want to believe to be true, and as long as we can just, you know, endorse the other person's right to believe whatever they want to believe, then we'll just call it a big, happy kind of thing, and we'll just say we can, we can coexist and we can get along, and we don't all have to have the same plumb line, the, the same morality. How's that working for the world? Truth is not relative. Truth, by definition, is absolute. Judges chapter 21, verse 25, uh, gives us an example of what this looked like in the Old Testament times, the same kind of relativity. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel, no one to set a plumb line, no one to set truth, no one to say what was what. So everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And he goes on from there to say that because they did what was right in their own eyes, it led to the demise of the nation of Israel. It led to their destruction because they said, I'm going to do whatever I want to do and you do whatever you want to do. It doesn't work that way. There is this place of consistent truth that God is the determiner of that I am to center my life on. I cannot stand in God's authority and be outside of his truth. If I'm going to stand in his authority, I have to stand in his truth. You see, living in your own truth leads to chaos, disorder, and ultimately to defeat. But living in God's truth brings stability, clarity, and ultimately victory. Which one are you going to live in? And let me just tell you, living in God's truth is not always comfortable. In fact, I'll go a step further. If you are living in God's truth or think you're living in God's truth, and there isn't a place of conflict in your life where you're struggling to line up who you are with who God says, then you may not be living in truth. Because God's truth is not always easy. It's not always fun. It challenges me. It pushes me. What's my nature? Just like the enemy, it's to be a liar. My flesh says go to the side of untruth. So that's going to be in battle if I'm going to live with truth, with the very truth I'm going to live with. My mom is an amazing woman. I have so much love for her. I am uh, who I am today largely because of my mom. She was my greatest source of encouragement when I was young. Um, I, I could not have made it through my childhood without my mother. She is, she's great. And even though I didn't come to Christ as a child, uh, there were years where we were involved in church and, and anything that I knew about the loving side of God was because of my mother. My, my favorite song uh, will always be this old, old song called Consider the Lilies. And it's because my mom, who could sing like an angel, used to sing that song in church. She was this amazing woman. And then when I was a teenager and my brother, who's older than me, also uh, an older teenager, uh, decided that he was going to live his life by his own set of morality. He was going to denounce the truth that he had been raised in. He was going to denounce the truth of Scripture. And he was going to make some very conscious decisions to go against the Word of God. And so he totally turned his life in this other direction. And my mom then was left with this uh, really tenuous place that maybe some of you have been, which is how do I love my child who's going off against truth and hold to what I've said I believe forever? And so my mom made this conscious decision to change what she believed was truth. Rather than 
have her son live differently in what she believed. She wanted to love him and she thought she was loving him well if she would accept his version of truth and change her version of truth. And what happened as a result is two decades of my mom walking away from God. She couldn't continue to stay in God and not be living in his truth. And so for the next two decades, she just drifted further and further and further away from God. So she was at this point of having no relationship and being really, really miserable. And then she came to this point of realizing, I've got to readdress this. And it's only been in the last five or 10 years that my mom has, has made the switch back and said, there is a way for me to love my son in his untruth, but cling to the things that are true. You and I are going to be challenged with those kinds of real life, practical situations where we have to choose, are we going to stand in truth or are we going to stand in what we want? And those two things will often conflict against each other. You see, when we allow God to define truth, then we are able to be transformed into his image. And being transformed into his image is a big part of what we're supposed to be about, that we are going through this process, the, the theological word is sanctification, this process of becoming like Christ, that he is transforming me into his image because of his truth. But when we take over defining truth, then we begin to make God in our own image. And here's the thing, a God made in your image or my image isn't worth anything and certainly isn't capable of being God. When I try to make God in my own image, you know what comes out? Something just as messed up and jacked up as I am. Where's the glory in that? Where's the God in that? I might feel better about myself for a season, but I'm not in the long run. My job is to allow the truth of God, which is absolute, which is given to us in this book. I don't like it. There are things in here that are offensive to me. Why? Because they go against my fleshly desires. They go against what I want to do. They go against me being in control. But when I learn to live in that truth, then John 8, 32 says, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Some of us aren't living in freedom and we keep wondering why, but we're not willing to stand in truth. Truth is the first step to living in freedom. And so we are to gird ourselves up and put the central part of everything else is this truth of God's word. It is who God is and is him defining what is right and what is wrong. And then we are to take on the breastplate of righteousness. Now for a Roman soldier, uh, we've probably all seen it in movies. We've seen gladiator and things like that. And we think of their breastplate and it's this bright gleaming gold or silver piece of, of metal that's really ornate. And that's not right. Uh, more often than not, the breastplate of, of the common soldier was made out of leather with sometimes wood over the top of it and then pieces of uh, metal, if they could find pieces of metal, just fitted over the top of it. And it was designed to protect as much as possible the heart, the lungs, the stomach, and the intestines, the vital organs. And, and for a lot of soldiers uh, at that time, on purpose, um, the backside uh, of the breastplate would be just a series of straps that wouldn't have any protection. And the reason was, if you're protected on the front and not on the back and you come in contact with the enemy, which direction are you gonna face? You're gonna face the enemy. It was to keep them from turning their back on the enemy. And so you face the enemy, you have this breastplate on and it has all these pieces to protect the vital organs. So too, we are to put on the breastplate of righteousness to guard our heart and to guard the things that are vital to our spiritual growth. And the first part of that is this theological term. It's just a big word and um, we'll define it. So it's, uh, it's called imputed righteousness. And here's what imputed righteousness means. It means that you're a mess and you can't do it on your own. And God took all of your sin and lived in perfect righteousness. And now he gives you his righteousness in exchange for your sin. 
He imputes, he gives you his righteousness. He puts his righteousness upon you. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So his work on the cross makes up our deficit and we are covered in his righteousness. Now, does that mean that I can go do whatever I wanna do? No, I'm still called to strive to live in righteousness. Psalm 119, 172 says, let my tongue sing of your word for all your commandments are righteousness. His commandments, I'm supposed to do everything I can to live by because they're, they're righteousness. How do we do that? Galatians 5, 16. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So the way that I keep his commandments and I, I strive for righteousness is I walk by the spirit. And that means every day at every moment I'm seeking what is the spirit's will? I don't get to compartmentalize my spiritual faith. It, it, you know, sometimes we think of our faith and it's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And we have all these different pieces and we have the work piece and the family piece and the recreation piece and the finance piece and we have the spiritual piece and we think when we put all the pieces together, it'll make this picture and the, the picture that it makes will, will, will be my life. And it doesn't work that way. We're supposed to take all of those pieces and have the spirit of God overlaying them so that when it all comes together, what it makes up is a picture of my life in Christ because Christ is over every aspect of my life. I walk in the spirit constantly, which means he's constantly at the forethought of my thoughts, how I'm going to spend my money, how I'm going to take care of my body, how I'm going to love my spouse, how I'm going to obey my parents, how I'm going to treat my children is constantly what would the spirit have me do? Now understand, when you've done all that you can do, you're still gonna fall short. Does that mean you should quit trying? <laughs> no. Paul addresses this at one point, he said, should I sin yet more so that grace may abound yet more? In other words, if there's this imputed righteousness of Christ and he's gonna give it to me, it's like a go sin all you want to card, right? I can do whatever I want to and say, hey, righteousness of Christ. You know what his response is? It's one of the strongest rebukes in all of scripture. His response is, God forbid. I don't do that, but I trust that his righteousness makes up the gap. It covers me. When I'm walking in the spirit and I'm trying to live by righteousness, his righteousness comes and it covers over me. It protects the vital areas of my spirit. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from your heart. So guard your heart with what? The breastplate of righteousness. The enemy has full access to my heart if I don't cover myself in righteousness. I can't just live life as I want without having heart consequences. You know one of the, the tricks of the enemy, what he's gonna tell you? You're not worth it. You're not good enough. You mess up. That sin you can't get out of your life. Ah, oh, yeah, you just keep failing. How could God love you? He's going to give all of these lies. You know what we respond to to protect our heart? You don't understand. I'm covered in the blood of Christ. I'm covered in his imputed righteousness. His righteousness is the authority I stand in. It's not about what I can do. I'm only doing what I'm doing to try to be more like him, but everything else is covered. Enemy, whatever you have to say to me doesn't hit. It doesn't stand. It doesn't have any impact on me because his righteousness is greater. I stand against the lies of the enemy covered by the righteousness of Christ that he has given me. It makes up for my shortcomings. It makes up for my fleshliness as long as I'm seeking to walk in the spirit and stay centered in him. The next thing we put on is the gospel of peace. Now, it says here that we are to put these on our feet. And so we look back at the Roman soldiers and uh, historians, a lot of historians believe that the success of the Roman empire and the Roman army was largely due to this essential piece of equipment that they had and the way that they had sandals and the kind of sandals that they had allowed them to be successful. And so the way their sandals were, which have been, you know, since then turned into gladiator shoes for women, which I totally don't understand by the way. 
and more power to you uh, if you wear them. They're great. They look good. But I'm a guy. I just need something that slips on. If it doesn't tie, it's even better for me. Um, so they would tie it. So they would be very secure to the legs. They would have all these. They, they wanted to make sure they were stable. And then the shoe sole would be a, a piece of thick leather. And they would take nails and they would drive them from the foot side down through it. Really what they did is they made the first pair of Adidas cleats. They had these very rugged cleat shoes so that they could be ready on any terrain to face the enemy. No matter what the terrain was, they were ready. If it was wet and slippery, if it was whatever, they could stand. And if the enemy charged at them, they could, they could dig in, they could be against the enemy. And they could also then push themselves forward when it came to hand-to-hand -hand combat because of these shoes that they had on. And they fought for a kind of peace as well. It was called the Pax Romana or the Roman peace, which is what's really interesting about the Roman peace is there wasn't a lot of peace. But what it really meant is we believe in peace through the power of the sword of Rome. You submit to who we are. We are the Roman Empire. Peace through power, get out of our way, surrender to us. And so God calls us now to live in this advancement of being shod with the gospel of the preparation of peace. And when we do that, we're ready for whatever comes our way. Colossians 3.15 says that the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you are called to peace. Now, if we're going to talk about peace, one thing we have to understand is what does the word mean? Peace is not the lack of the storm. A lot of times we think about peace and we think, God, just take the storm away. If you can make everything work out the way I want it to work out, have that job go the way I want it to go, have everything be the way I'm telling you I want it to be. Peace is not the absence of the storm. Peace is in the very middle of the storm, knowing that God is in control. Knowing that God is sovereign, that God has a plan that's what brings me peace. And peace then requires total surrender of both the process and the outcome to God's will. It's a total surrender. It's a letting go and letting God. It's a saying, God, I trust you with the process and I trust you with the outcome that you are not safe, but you have a plan that is greater than anything that I could understand. And so I'm going to surrender to your plan and the role that you have me playing in this cosmic charade movie that you're doing. I submit to that. I surrender to who you are. It's exemplified by Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion night before he's crucified he goes alone to prayer and he cries out God if there's any other way there's any other way for you to redeem these people to make them righteous to make them right if you can do it in any other way let this cup pass from me I don't want to go to the cross I don't want to be beaten I don't want to be crucified I don't want to go through this and then he ends with these words Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You have every right to tell God how you want things to go. But you will not experience peace until at the end of it, you surrender how it goes and the outcome to him. God, here's what I want, but I'm going to give everything over to you. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. A couple things there. It says that we do this by prayer. You're not gonna have peace if you're not spending time on your knees. Doesn't matter how much you complain about it. I, I am notorious at times for telling students and people who come to me and complain about problems, I'll ask them if they've prayed about it. And a lot of times they go, well, sorta, a little bit. My response is very lovingly to tell them, if you don't pray, don't pout. Jesus loves you. <laughs> but we spend a lot of time pouting and not praying. A lot of time having our own little pity party. The key to 
to peace starts in prayer. It starts by spending time on our knees and making our request with thanksgiving. Are you willing to thank God for the storms? For the troubled times? For the rough situations? Thank him for who he is and what he has already done for you. And then you can have peace, and it says, which transcends all understanding. If you have peace and it makes sense that you have peace in your life, you probably don't have peace. You probably have calm. True peace passes all understanding. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to us sometimes, and it certainly doesn't make sense to the world. But it's one of the gifts of God to his children. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I give you peace. It's not the kind of peace that comes from the world. Stand having your feet shod with this preparation of peace. John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Not you might have trouble, not you might have two fender benders in your life and the rest will be great. In this life, you will have trouble. You're either experiencing it, you just came through it, or it's coming. But take heart, I Jesus have overcome the world. And whereas the Roman soldier used his feet and his shoes to advance Pax Romana, peace through power, we carry the news of the gospel of peace through surrender. And the world doesn't understand it. And one of the greatest attractions to people to exchange their life for a life in Christ, to come to Christ and to go from common life to uncommon life is the point when they see peace in people that doesn't make sense. The peace of God. How is it that in the midst of your cancer, you're still praising God? I don't understand that. How is it that you lost your job, but you're still just tranquil every time I talk to you? You don't seem to be sweating it. I don't understand it either. All I know is this. I love Jesus. I try to live in the spirit. I give it all to him. Here I am. Oh, I want some of that. We cover ourselves with the breastplate of righteousness, standing firm in who he is, attached to the belt of truth that is the plumb line for where we are going to live our lives, searching for truth to be the absolute to tell us what we are to do. And we shot our feet with the preparation of peace so that we can stand firm in heavenly places in the authority of Christ, which is greater than the power of Satan. And it takes work. It takes being intentional. You didn't become a believer in Christ and have him go, hey, let me throw all this armor on you. In fact, it says you are to put on the armor. It doesn't say God's going to put the armor on you. It says you and I are to put the armor of God on. Next week, we're going to look at the last three pieces of the armor of God and what it takes for us to be prepared and dressed for battle. And then the week after that, we're gonna talk about how we don't just stand in the authority of God reacting to the things that happen with Satan, but how we turn and go the other direction and we advance the authority of God for the glory of the Father. I hope that you'll be able to join us and be here with us as we go through this series of learning how it is that we have victory in our lives. As we prepare to close here in just a minute this morning, if you are here and there are areas in your life that you're struggling and you're in need of peace, you have questions about truth, whatever it is that you may be dealing with, at the end of service, our prayer team will be down front available to meet with you and to pray with you about whatever is going on into your life. If you have questions about how do I actually begin to put on the armor of God, come and pray with someone down here. But as we prepare to go out into this week and to celebrate Memorial Day, would you stand with me and let's pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you that you reveal truth to us that has the ability to set us free, to have us live in accordance with your plan and your sovereignty and your omniscience. Thank you, Father, for your righteousness that covers us and protects our hearts, righteousness that you paid for on the cross, taking over all of our mistakes and covering us. Thank you for your peace that passes all understanding. Father, may we learn to put on the armor of God. And as you go into this week, then may you do it with this word of benediction and blessing. May you enjoy the freedom that comes from having all things held together in his truth. May your heart overflow with joy and goodness as you dress in his righteousness alone. And may you stand firm and unshaken in his peace that passes all understanding, regardless of what life may bring your way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God bless. Have a great week.